Hey, very good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sean. This is Alex. Hey, you're listening to another episode of Coaster Kings Radio. Today we're discussing unexpectedly incredible rides. What does that mean? Well, may I ask? That means that we were inspired by some of our wildest experiences throughout our how many years of theme parking. Uh, where there were some really unlikely surprises. We're like, what is this ride? Why is it so good? Or some of those rides where people have talked about it, but you weren't expecting much, or it just like blew us away. So we compiled the list, kind of narrowed it down to some of our favorites. And by some, I mean like a good 20 different rides. So we will start our grand journey with a final sea battle, which is located at Wuchi Sunek Land. This is the ride that honestly inspired the episode. This is, you're probably at home thinking like, what, the, what is this? What is Final Sea Battle? You may have heard of Wuchi Sunak Land. This is um, the giant blue b and wing coaster that went viral that has like the big mountain in the middle of the park that it flies around and flies through like the perfect looking pipe dream b and wing coaster. This is that park. And we came for the wing coaster really, but we stayed... For Final Sea Battle, which is a Pirates of the Caribbean-esque type ride using a Spider-Man, like a universal Spider-Man um, dark ride system. And it was just amazing. It's one of the best dark rides we've ever been on. It's kind of funny because we had dedicated practically a whole day to this park, which some other parks on our China trip, we did one or two a day, like combined them. And so we figured, you know what, we're just going to do all of it. Like the factories and Pearl Coast wasn't ready yet, even though we thought it was. And so we wandered into this giant ship-looking show building. We did not know what to expect. It said in Chinese something odd, and it said Final Sea Battle in English. And we're like, all right, well, you know, it was. we already had done a full loop around the park. And we said, let's ride this and see what it is. Really massive queue, completely dead. Eventually, we were pushed 3D glasses in our hand. And we're like, what's going on? <laughs> We sit down, and what looks like a station looks kind of like a ship as well. So, all right, it was definitely ship-themed. Little did we know that it was a really long dark ride, first of all. Like, that thing just went on forever. Using a lot of cool screen technology, a really great blending with physical scenes. It was like Spider-Man if it was, like, a Chinese sea battle between these ships. And there is uh, two scenes that stand out to me the most. There's one scene where a giant kind of a sea serpent dragony kind of sea monster comes out of the water you kind of see it and then you move into a corner of the ship and then above you is a screen where it looks like it bursts through the ceiling i still remember shrieking at that moment because it was just pretty well done the honestly. screen was, n- was not obvious it was not obvious only it was just like this monster breaking through the ceiling even though it was a screen and then there's a moment where you on your little ship are floating between two ships out in the open ocean and so there's this really cool scene with physical water and like cannonballs flying into the water so kind of like a fountain effect where you go between one ship and another big ship kind of like that's what the scene is um supposed to be conveying i really love the ride we wrote that thing several times for sure well it was just spectacular it was such a such a huge surprise because it was so unexpected and yet it was so amazing so we were just like really wanted to bask in it we were basking in the glory of this totally unexpected surprise this incredible e-ticket dark ride like universal disney level dark ride at this pretty unassuming i mean a beautiful park but like you know you just don't know what you get with uh some of these chinese projects there's plenty of ambitious or seemingly ambitious uh rides in parks like these that kind of fall flat but this one really delivered it's uh was an unforgettable an unforgettable dark ride experience to I th- say the least. I think of all the rides we've ever ridden or that are on this list, Final Sea Battle, I will say, is probably the ride I was most surprised by, most shocked yeah, by. I never wandered surprise. into an attraction and been like, oh my god, this is rival Spider-Man. Yeah. I think for a second I liked it better than Spider-Man. It was that good. Yeah. I can't believe that this regional park in China, I mean, we had people emailing us, contacting us, and were like, we never heard of this ride, what is it? Because we were hyping it up on, on the coastkings.com. We wrote a whole article on the park. And we were definitely not the only people that did not know of its existence. We even had friends visit that completely skipped the ride, didn't know what it was. They just walked straight past it, which is not uncommon for a Chinese theme park visit. But um, yeah, this is really one of those rides where uh, nobody knows about it. And it's absolutely spectacular. <laughs> next. So next on our list is um, Flucht von Norgorod. 
at a, a Hansa Park. This is a, a pretty early generation Gershlauer uh, Eurofighter, but it's incredibly smooth. Definitely one of, if not the best of the first generation Eurofighters and still one of, one of Gershlauer's best rides. And uh, I had ridden it in 2013 and remember really liking it, but then revisiting Hansa Park uh, nearly 10 years later um, to ride Schroeder's Karnen, uh, which is good. It's very good. Different in a lot of ways, but then also similar to Flux von Lofgerod in some ways. Um, but like we rode Karnen first, and you were like, you liked it. And then we rode Flux von Lofgerod, and you were like, what? Like dying. What? Like you... So Schroeder's Karnen <laughs> was kind of the reason we went to Hansa Park, which I think is the reason for most enthusiasts traveling across the pond. But then Flug von Lofgott, which obviously I'd heard about it, you know, read about it, knew the stats, all the, all the good coaches, the nerdy stuff. But sometimes stats are just stats and idea is just an idea. And this is one of those rides where you get on that ride vehicle, you have this okay dark ride scene, and you're really not expecting too much from the coaster. But it just blew me away. Incredible launch. So smooth. I, don't, I think it's by far the smoothest Euro fighter I've ever ridden. Um, and then having all the elements is so well hidden inside that building. I mean, they hide a launch, some really tall elements, vertical lifts. Everything is hidden inside this building. There's only a really small part of the ride that's outside, which is the second half of, of the ride. You have a vertical lift with a beyond vertical drop. And then you have kind of like a, like a boomerang-shaped turnaround ride of water. And then you come back and have a zero-G roll into... Wait, that is into the... Yeah, the, the vertical lift, vertical Sorry, drop. Sorry, I messed half. up the order. That's okay. I, either way, <laughs> most of the ride is indoor, so I wasn't sure what to expect, and it's beautifully hidden. That ride is just a feisty little ride, um, way better than I expected. Probably my favorite Euro fight in the world, hands down. Yeah, I would have to say it's my favorite, too. There's some really great uh, Infinity Coasters and, and Euro Fighters and stuff, but um, that's definitely, definitely up there for me. Um, now we're switching gears entirely uh, from dark rides and water rides, or dark rides and coasters, to uh, a major water ride, actually. So this one I wanted to have on the list because I'm usually not a big water ride fan, generally speaking. If it's really well-themed, you'll catch me on them. But, God, the whole joy that people get out of getting absolutely drenched to the point where every body part is soaked and nothing is dry... I don't enjoy that personally as much, but I will have to give credit where credit is due. And Infinity Falls at SeaWorld Orlando is on this list because I was expecting a rapid ride with a big drop, which, you know, we've seen before where requests, rapid rides aren't new. But this thing is uh, incredible. Like, not just the drop, which is pretty impressive, but I think overall the use of rapids is really impressive. It feels like a very modern, risky, edgy Rapids ride that has a beautiful aesthetic, great landscaping, animal interaction, and then it just has a, a combination of rapids I've never seen anywhere before. Just just the sheer shape of, of the water and the flume, the drops that are between the waves. I can't believe this thing is real. I love this ride. Yeah, it's a stylish ride, great curb appeal. It's long. I love how long it is. It's Yeah, the two parts are... A good length, and There's it doesn't feel like it's very nice. Itself. I like that it's it takes the ride takes place on several levels, like physically, because you have like a below midway level sequence, a couple of below midway level sequences, and then uh, an elevated portion that is above midway level that is completely obscured from view. Um, and it's just nice. It's just a stylish. Ra- I don't think when I think of rapids rides, I don't think of style. But this is like the world's first stylish rapids ride. It's beautifully landscaped. It's it's just and it's pretty. Yeah, that's the cool thing. It's beautifully landscaped, yet it feels so modern with the Very. the upside down cone that they kind of adopted as like their support structure as like a thematic element around the ride. Rock work has been really well done. All these little water features. Oh, the audio. Is audio is awesome. Yeah. It's like high pace but kind of jungly. They just did it completely right, and I must say, that makes me extra hype for Catapult Falls in Seville San Antonio. That's yes. under construction right now, because it takes that same aesthetic, and it applies it to the first launched log flume, which is kind of cool as yeah. well. Can't wait for that. Let's move on. Well, let's speak of Texas. Of Texas. Right? Okay, so the Boardwalk Bullet, uh, a Kima Boardwalk, this is a early generation gravity group wooden coaster. This was, I believe, their fourth or fifth project. Uh, it opened in 2007, 
And um, this is not one you hear a whole lot about. It's uh, I've heard good things and bad things about it, but really just in general, not a lot of things. Um, we wrote it in 2020, in March of 2020, just as the world was collapsing. And um, it, we had some excellent rides on it. I was so blown away by it. Yeah, I'm usually not the biggest wooden coaster fan, and I'm kind of always weary because if there's one coaster that quickly doesn't run smooth, and Everland has a very different experience on them, it's usually a wooden coaster. But the Kima Boardwalk's Boardwalk Bullet, impressive. The pacing is, I think, the biggest thing that sent out to me. The thing is, like, it's unrelenting. It just goes and goes and goes. Great layout. Really compact. You wouldn't think they could fit as much ride in the space that they did. Totally. They used their height to their advantage, and they packed this ride with a couple figure eights and a great pacing in there. And while it's a ride that I occasionally hear people talk about, it's not nearly as discussed as some other wooden coasters that I find much less interesting. So uh, definitely a little shout-out to Kima Boardwalk's Boardwalk Bullet. Uh, and I guess in keeping with our, our ocean theme... Yeah, not too far away. <laughs> um, wait, are we going with... Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, I was you're getting ahead of yourself. I sure did. Okay, well... I don't, what, we'll skip. We'll we'll talk about Texas Stingray now, actually, because it's close and it's good. It's and it's amazing. Wood. It's a wooden coaster. It's oceany. Um, Texas Stingray is on here because we just from the get go we did not expect this roller coaster to be announced. And when they built it, we were like, okay, let's you know, let's give it a shot. And then we wrote it right after it opened, and it was just we were just blown away. Yeah, totally. Like, I mean, we had high expectations, but man, they were just blown away by this ride. I think the saddest thing about this ride is that it opened, like, March 2020, right before the pandemic, just shut everything down, park was shuttered. We were there a couple days, we were there when Disney World announced their closure a couple days, for like a couple days later. We were, I still remember being in Aquatica and being like, oh my god, all the Disney parks are closing, like, this is for real. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> but yeah, Texas Stingray... Incredible ride, very smooth, great first drop. It has a layout that is quite unique. It has a couple of those signature GCI moments where it has the big waving turns. But then in the middle of the ride, it just kind of like spins off and goes around the rapids ride and comes back to the plot. And there's a high differentiation in the plot of land that it's built on. And all things considered, uh, one of my favorite GCIs, and I just was not expecting that. Mm -hmm. You ride, you know, the Great Coast International woodies all the time and they kind of run together and this thing just felt so in its own league in a way and that's something i just really appreciate about this ride people need to go go visit just for that ride yeah definitely okay so now we are going we're backtracking on the list we really should have had these two rides next to each other these two wooden coasters but now we are going to chimong ocean kingdom which you know we've talked about it so many yeah. times over the last four seasons prior Chimelong Ocean Kingdom doesn't have very many rides, and the rides that we went to Chimelong for were the roller coasters, primarily, and the roller coasters all um, exceeded our expectations, but then there was a dark ride that, if I remember correctly, we didn't know that there was a dark ride there, did we? I can't no, even remember I remember vividly apparent. that we were actually looking to go eat, and we wanted to go to the restaurant right. that was We were looking for a restaurant. The giant Bullish Hog Aquarium. <laughs> and then the restaurant didn't really have the menu item I liked, so then through Google Translate, we were they were like, oh, go to the restaurant on the other side of the park. And I was like, okay, great. It's just nighttime show still going on, because I was very focused on the nighttime show I wanted to see. And then we saw this queue with a lot of people, and they were like, this seems important. It's also in the building of the aquarium. Probably has to do something with the aquarium. So then we jumped in line for this submarine-themed on-the-mover dark ride that ends, ended up having a giant piece of track or like several pieces of track going through the center of the Wheel Shark Aquarium. And then it would tilt your vehicle kind of like upward to look at the aquarium above you. It was so impressive. I still remember the giant stingrays and the wheel sharks floating around all around you. And this was on like an all the move dark ride. It also had actual dark ride scenes, like a volcano scene where the volcano was erupting and there's a lot going on. But the focus of the ride was really going and taking you through the whole aquarium, which at that time was still the world's largest aquarium. Really impressive. I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. This was such a, a an amazing surprise and a really nice compliment to the kind of stuff that was already at, um, Chimong Ocean Kingdom, like I said, they don't really have a lot of rides, but man, the ones that they have, like, really slap. This one, I mean, we filmed little chunks of it 
They've gone viral and several they, times on yeah, TikTok. This, this was one of our first viral TikTok videos was a clip from this ride. And I watched it so many times, like, putting that video together. And every time I was just, like, so delighted and um, was marveling at this ride and their ability and their decision um, to do a ride like that. Um, so that was that was really a memorable experience at one of our favorite parks, for sure. For sure. And then recently we did a trip to Virginia to the King's Dominion and to do Bush Gardens Williamsburg. One of the reasons we went is because they get just opened Dark Coaster, which I wasn't like something we were super hyped for. We just kind of wanted to check it out because the whole concept sounded kind of nice. And it is the first to it just have a brand layout new. and yeah. then using a track switch, having a train go around it twice. So in a small show building, you can put a long indoor coaster. And that desired effect was very impressive because I still remember we got there really early. We like ran through the park because we rope dropped it. And anyone know, that knows Bush Gardens Williamsburg knows that that's the clear opposite side of the park from the entrance. <laughs> and so we got, we got there. We only we waited like one or two trains. It was great. And so this ride up was like, hey, I recognize you guys from social media. Like you should ride in the back. It's the best seat. We're like, all right, done deal. We'll sit in the back. No biggie. That sounds good. And then we strapped in. The biggest concern really was rider comfort because mm-hmm. historically speaking, the Intamin kind of like squatting straddle, straddle coasters, coasters are not the most comfortable, but they've kind of perfected the design. It was pretty comfortable. Yeah. And um, ride experience wise, very good. I did not, I did not yeah. expect it to feel like such a long coaster. I really thought it was going to be an obvious repetition of the ride twice. But to me, it honestly, especially with the different effects, kind of just felt like a giant ride inside. Oh yeah, it's marvelous. It's perfect because indoor coasters are usually fairly repetitious anyway. So not only was it an excellent use of space, but if you were going to do this trick where you go through the coaster twice, an indoor coaster is the perfect application of that. And more importantly, they had little scenes on this ride that would change. So the first time around, the scenes did one thing, and the second time around, the story of the ride would progress to a degree. Sorry, well, we probably should have said mapping. spoilers. We should have said, really like, well spoilers. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we, we only read it once because the ride for the rest of the day had an enormous line. I'm so glad that we went and rode that first because that was... I will admit, this kind of low capacity. I forgot how many cars there are. But it's 10 passengers per It's like dispatch. a 10 passenger dispatch. It really isn't that many. Two trains. Two trains. But I will say, I would have waited an hour for it, and I would have still been like, wow, yeah. this is actually really been like, good. like, oh, this is cute. I yeah. just wasn't expecting that yeah. at all. Just like, clever. At all. I was I'm kind of blown away. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. We yeah. came off that, like, really happy. Yeah, like, we oh came off, and we were like, oh, that was really... We have to really ride one to San Diego now. Interesting. Yeah. yeah, it was really clever. For sure. Uh, all right, where are we at? Where are we at? Oh, back to back to the Guangdong province, um, which is where uh, Chaimong Ocean Kingdom is as well. Where Guang- so Guangzhou Sunak Land... Is the park that you go to to ride that dueling inverted and sit down launched Intamin? Yeah, the full circuit um, shuttle. Dolling Dragon, right? Or no, that du- or is it Dueling Dragon? Dolling Dragon is is Happy Valley, and uh, that's a dueling with an A. Yeah, du- like, oh, this one is dueling. Like it's double, co- yeah. Co- correctly spelled and pronounced. Um, so that was the ride that we traveled to this park for, and because it was next to the airport, um, but we. We're really pleasantly surprised with their flying theater. Yeah, in true Sunak fashion, because this is another Sunak park like we discussed in the beginning of the episode, their dark ride focus and their indoor attraction focus was way more than I had ever expected. And they had a flying theater called Flying Over Guangdong, like Alice just said. And it was a um, an LED screen theater that had a completely animated flying sequence so it wasn't like it was filmed with the camera it was all animated but it was really high quality and it was just beautiful gorgeous it highlighted all these parts of Guangdong obviously Uh, I had a marvelous time first of all the ride system which I'm not entirely sure who made it but it's kind of like this giant theater and then it just kind of sinks yeah and everyone's certainly vertical would go upstairs it was sort of like you would go up two stories and then you were at this level seating area and it would sort of flip itself Tilt, yeah so the back row would go up and the front row would go down the center row kind of stayed in the middle and it was a very clever uh way to to develop a high capacity flying theater that uh wasn't going to be a huge mechanical issue 
Um, and the Chinese parks, there's a lot of good flying theaters in China. China loves flying theaters. And so this was kind of like with um, Final Sea Battle. Like, we, we went in with, low, with no expectations, and the quality was so high that it ended up becoming one of our favorite examples of this type of ride. And it was something that, like, we didn't talk to anybody else who had written it because it was brand new, and it's in China. And so we were just delighted with what, with what we were able to discover. Um, all right, so now, okay. So now, oh, now we're going to... Switching gears to <laughs> Efteling. Yes. Um, Efteling obviously is pretty well known for its dark ride collection, its roller coaster collection, being a giant forest, fairy tale forest. Highly visited theme park. Everyone listening to this podcast is probably pretty familiar with what Efteling has to offer. However, we want to give a shout out to Fata Morgana, which is their 1001 Arabian Nights themed dark ride a la Pirates of the Caribbean. First of all, marvelous soundtrack. Mm-hmm. I will play that in the living room if I really felt yeah. inclined to. We think about that type it song. in on YouTube. Um, <laughs> Lives rent free. And then the way that it uses the intimate towboat system, there's never more than one boat in the scene, which kind of makes you feel like you're alone in the entire time when you ride the ride. Which is my biggest criticism of rides like Pirates of the Caribbean, where there's always a bunch of boats kind of stacking together. Mm-hmm. It's just like you're always the only one. It uses a lot of doors and all that kind of stuff to um, to make you feel like you're alone in that scene. I really wanted to include an Efteling ride, especially for me. Like my first visit to Efteling, so Symbolica hadn't opened yet. Dronflucht was the dark ride that everyone was talking about, and and then people brought up Carnival Festival because it was you know like described to me as a as a it's a small world ripoff, but I feel like it's a little more. To it that. That, yeah. And Fata Makana was just kind of there. They were like, oh yeah, and ride Fata Makana. It's sort of like a, a, a Middle Eastern Pirates of the Caribbean. And, and then you ride it, and it's just like, some of those scenes, the last, that scene toward the end of the party. In, There's like hundreds of animatronics. Absolutely. So impressive. Gorgeous. It makes pirates feel bare. It makes, yeah, it just, I mean, so, and then I got to thinking, this ride opened in 1986. And the only other dark ride at Efteling at the time was Carnival Festival, which is was their first dark ride and is cute for what it is, but it's very simple comparatively. It's a, it's a, a, it's a pretty simple dark ride under any measure, and Phantom Makana is an exceptional dark ride by any measure. So the, the fact that they went from Carnival Festival to Phantom Makana for their second dark ride... Um, is really something else. And in a lot of ways, I like it even better than uh, Romflug, which opened in 1993. That's kind of, that was, that's really like kind of the sweetheart dark ride of the operation. That's, that, that's everyone's favorite. And there's things about that ride that are exceptional, but there's things that I think Fatou Makhana does even better. And at the time when it opened, it, there was just, it would be hard for me to say that there was any expectations for something that spectacular even at a place as, as uh, marvelous as Efteling. So. Yeah, for a classic mechanical, physical effect only dark ride, Fata Mahara does it all. It does it all very well. And even though, obviously, animatronics are showing a bit of an age, it's that by no means is a detractor yeah. for me. I just it's think overall form. it's so impressive. It's just beautiful. And I remember my first time riding it, um, I was just kind of like overwhelmed by... I don't want to call it scary, but it was very impactful. It was one of those rides where, like, you're really drawn into what's going on. Yeah. Kind of has a somber, mysterious, kind of dark edge it to it. It sucks you in. It's compelling. It's, um, yeah. Mysterious. It's fin- fantastic. It's really one of those rides where people don't talk about it enough, I guess, is what I'm trying to get yeah. at. Yeah. Uh, speaking of rides that people don't talk about enough in the grand scheme of roller coasters, uh, in my opinion, is Fujiyama at Fuji Q Highland. Which Alex, I guess, had different expectations than I did. <laughs> but when I first went to Fujiku Highland, it was maybe like my fourth most important ride for me because, first of all, it's a hyper coaster, it's a Togo. People didn't talk about it too much, and if they did talk about it, Togo just wasn't a name that people associated with a good roller coaster. So I was kind of cautiously excited to get the credit. But then riding it, I mean, Fujiyama blew me away. Intense. Crazy airtime, really comfortable, really. Um, unusual elements, like having a giant dirt turn, 
that's like after this massive drop, there's just this big dirt turn and having the alternating airtime hills that kind of zigzag the around. Like, air. Like, yeah. I don't know who thought of that, but it's wild. It's awesome. So, Fujiyama for me, I guess I would say, Sean, Sean and I liked Fujiyama equally, but Sean's expectations were lower than mine were. I was ready to get my heart broken if that ride wasn't any good because I was so excited for it. And I, I guess I would say that it still wasn't my highest priority at the park because Ijenaika was. But Fujiyama ended up being, at least at the time, I, I guess it's hard to say. Fujiyama was the only one that we rode twice. It was certainly easier to we ride twice. We have to admit that the operations of Fujiyama were really good. Two yeah. trains, ran the rain. And the trains were like massive capacity. Like, it was this, a good to operation. To this day, I would say that Fujiyama is my favorite hyper coaster, like traditional. Interesting hyper. I would say up until recently, I I would have said that Steel Dragon two thousand was my favorite Giga, but now I three hundred five has dethroned it. But I used to say that like both of my favorites of those pedigrees, respectively, were in Japan. But now I would give it to to at least to Fujiyama. Just because Fujiyama is just so weird. It's like over 6,000 feet of total chaos. Lots of unexpected moves, but like full of pleasant surprises and just runs really well. And it doesn't really repeat itself, which is also kind of nice for a hypercoaster particularly. Definitely worth it. And I kind of want to ride it now to build a giant tower in the middle of the turnaround. Oh, yes. This observation deck climbing thingy. That sounds pretty cool because it's like mm-hmm. 200 feet tall. So uh, we'll be back for sure. I can't wait to go back there. Um, well, I guess I can because the operations are terrible. But Talk about another ride that I was expecting to be really rough. Well, historically, you would think that a Fukoma suspended looping coaster, SLC, will be rough. But then I went to Morris Piers last week or two weeks ago. And um, a Great Nor'easter is such an incredible retrack, repaint, new train situation that's just one of the SLCs where we're like, see, the layout is incredible. It's just that they don't really run that well usually. But Great Nor Easter displayed what a smooth coaster can do with this layout. Bonkers. Love Great Nor Easter. Such a good ride. You guys, Sean was so cute <laughs> just now when we were at Maury's Piers because I knew he was really excited. Sean, and I mean, we love Vacomas, and Sean is especially a, a, a Vacoma SLC cheerleader, and this ride was super high on his bucket list for that reason. I hadn't ridden it since the retrack, and needless to say, the retrack of the ride, it, the, this ride is, not only is it smooth, but it's like one of the smoothest inverted coasters I've ever been on, and again, like Sean just said, it really allows the, the layout of the SLC to shine, especially the application of this ride at Maury's Piers and the way that it's intertwined with so many other attractions. It's really quite um, incredible that this ride was built. Yeah, it's kind of funny. It kind of feels like the whole ride is just foot chopper central because between the lock flume, the water slides, the bar, whatever else you can possibly think of, and then the unique support structure, there's just a lot going on around you at all times. It's like weaving an SLC layout through like a densely packed pier, which is literally what it does. I will say for the SLC knowers and fans out there, you can sense the differences in the layout. There's elements that are pushed out a little bit. Supports work differently. The station's elevated and you use instead of a breaker on the station. So as a nerd, I also absolutely adored noticing all the differences in the layout, even though they're slight. If you ride enough SLCs, you'll <laughs> notice how different it really is, which is the funny thing about Great Nor'easter, I think. This was, you on the Great Nor'easter was like you in your in your best day, like the best version Oh, I had to ride yourself. again. I spent an extra time. Sean rode it twice. I really wanted to ride Zoom Flume and Sean's not a big water ride guys, so we compromised. I mean, I loved the SLC, but I really wanted to ride the Flume, and I was like, go ride Nor'easter again. I'll ride the Flume. And Sean, and, and after we left, Sean was like, I could have ridden that again. I could, oh, yeah. I could I have ridden that day all pass day. And he's ridden all day. Sean was ready to buy a season pass <laughs> to, to Wildwood, New Jersey, to ride, so that he could session the Great Nor'easter. Um, but yeah, even for non vacoma simps, I think there's a lot, a lot, a lot to appreciate there with that ride. Talking about um, rides I can ride all day. <laughs> okay, so th- before I introduce this ride, I want to point out that this is the only ride from Disney on the list. On the list, we we when we put this list together, we were like, we don't really think that Universal or Disney rides would be appropriate 
inclusions on this list because Disney and Universal rides are always so well advertised, well documented, and held to a high well standards. promoted and held to very high standards. Then we thought about it, and there was like, now there's one ride that absolutely belongs on this list um, because the degree of quality, the magnificence, the splendor of this ride in relationship to its notoriety or lack thereof, the infrequency with which people discuss it, probably because it's so overshadowed by um, the rides that it shares a park with. You may have guessed it. It is the storybook voyages of Sinbad at Tokyo Disney Sea, easily one of Disney's best dark rides. And for ahead, those that yeah. have been following us for a while, or have been listening to us from like season one. You'll know that we absolutely adore this ride, but I will say I never really see anyone talk about it. Like Alex said, it is just extremely yeah, underrated. Really, it is. I love it. The same. And what's funny is it's really, it, in some ways, it's similar to Phantom Arcana. In fact, characters from the, for, I, I guess it, it, it really is based on the same events. The, the, uh, the hundred thousand and one nights and things of that nature. The, um, the big, uh, I don't know, is he a genie? The, the, the big giant guy that's like locked in the cage. I think cage a genie, he, yeah. Yeah, he makes an appearance in both rides, for example. And, or he's just a giant from the stories. But, but I don't um, know, he's It is there. funny that like two of the greatest, most underrated dark rides in the world are themed to Thousand and One Nights, which is a, which is a fable, a series of fables that doesn't actually have like a franchise attached to it, which I think is partially why um, these rides aren't talked about as much. But um, Sinbad is definitely Phantom Makana for Disney people. It's cute. It's it's like a Pirates of the Caribbean meets It's a Small World um, in the Persian Gulf, and it's got a great song. The animatronics have like are are they really detailed and and human features and stuff, but like sort of a cartoonish approach, much we, more detailed. Than we like love this so much that we named our cat after the little companion tiger on the ride. Sean do. Oh, yes. The obligatory main character companion on this ride is a baby tiger named Sean do. And so our, our cat, our white Lynx Point Simon's That alone cat, makes me want to go back to Tokyo like, tomorrow, honestly. Yeah. I do. I'm, when, when we come back to Shanghai, or not Shanghai, when we go back to Tokyo Disney, there will be a great reunion, a great Sinbad storybook voyage reunion, um, which I eagerly anticipate. So on okay. uh, the next installment of the episode where we just love on Vacomas, Blue Hawk at Six Flags Over Georgia, another unique, very smooth Vacoma installation over water. Blue Hawk previously went through life as Ninja and prior to that went through life as Kamikaze at Conco's Party Pier. Conco's Party Pier, which, which is actually right, right next, next to door. where Green Arista is built. Yes. So in a way they're like kinda connected. If you've ever looked at Ninja Maybe this is not something that people normally do, but if you've ever looked at Ninja and thought to yourself, like, wow, that, or I guess it's Blue Hawk now. If you've ever looked at Blue Hawk and thought to yourself, wow, this is kind of like a Vacoma SLC, but a sit-down version, well, that's exactly what it is. And I like to think that Maurice Pierce was very conscientious of this when they built uh, the Great Nor'easter, because they were directly competing with Conco's, and Conco's with Vacoma developed this roller coaster with its double vertical loop thing that would evolve into the uh, rollover element for the SLC. And then the single dive sidewinder and the double quirks were all perfectly wrapped up in a little bow in this compact pier. Yeah, for layout. anyone that had knows the layout of Blue Hawk and obviously an SLC, it's, it's uncanny it's literally, yeah. how similar it is. I mean, even from, the shape of the brake run and like the pre lifts and stuff, like everything is very SLC, which is really enjoyable in, in a coaster nerdy way. But also, Blue Hawk just runs super well. Having gotten some retract done, um, having the Facoma MK1212 trains, it is just a really pleasant and honestly quite unique ride. And I absolutely adore that ride. And even though it went through life such a bad rep as Ninja. I think the general public now loves that ride, and it's it was unexpectedly good. Like, I was ready to get beaten up a little bit, because let's be fair, it's an old Facoma looper. It's not going to be the smoothest thing around, but God, it was so smooth, so enjoyable, so forceful. I 
we actually were about to go back there this week just to ride Blue Hawk, honestly, but the park is closed during the week. So yeah, that unfortunately, it's the first week of August, and they're already closed on weekdays again for school. But um, who knows? Maybe we'll maybe we'll find ourselves um, at Six Flags Over Georgia before the the season is out. I do love that park, and and Blue Hawk is like for me uh, just a, a, a cornerstone of my love for Six Flags Over Georgia, and I know it is um, for you too. Oh, for sure. Um, all right, so moving on back to Europe, more another dark ride. I'm proud of us. We're, I feel like we are making distinguished choices. It's, I, it's not just a bunch of roller coasters. Because when I first was thinking this, I was thinking roller coasters. But then it's again, it's because a dark ride didn't catalyst, inspire the episode. Well, yeah, yeah, final sea battle really is what made this episode happen. <laughs> Speaking of sea battles, uh, but now yes, uh, now we're we're doing we're doing pirates again. We're doing boat rides. We are at Europa Park. Uh, on their newest um, e-ticket ride, Peraptin in Batavia, the uh, the crown jewel of Europa Park's uh, Netherlands area. Um, the original Peraptin in Batavia burned down uh, pretty notoriously. I rode the original. It was fine. It wasn't anything, like, super... It, it, I mean, it was kind of hokey. Not as bad as their Haunted Mansion ride or, like, some of their other, like, older dark rides, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't bad. And then with the new version, they really took the opportunity to build, like, the perfect, like, textbook next-generation dark ride. So it starts off pretty good with the queue because you go through this, like, tavern and then into the warehouse. And there's a pretty uh, handsome, nice, smooth animatronic that's there giving you the whole spiel in, like, three languages. And then you kind of make your way up to the street level of this back alley where you kind of see the ocean in the distance. You're in Batavia, which is modern day Jakarta, um, old settlement of the Netherlands. And then that's where you board your boat to enter the stormy seas. And the first scene is like a lightning scene and the little otter sidekick. Cause you know, you have to yeah, have a little animal, animal sidekick yeah. for a successful boat ride. Yeah. Um, and the pirate guy are telling you something and then you go down this drop in the storm and it is a beautifully detailed, very modern dark ride that is really colorful, uses a great projection mapping LED screens, but also loads of physical sets and water effects. Um, I was so impressed by literally everything about it that this is the thing we wrote the most. We ended up sessioning at the end of the day. Instead of riding the coasters more, we just ended up riding Piraten and Batavia more. Such an incredible ride. Yeah, beautiful ride. Uh, a great showcase for, for what Mac is capable of. Which is great, because that's really, in my mind, that's what, when I think of Europa Park, I think of uh, Mac rides flexing their muscles and, and showing off their very best uh, uninhibited uh, creativity opportunities. And this, this you could, I can only hope that um, more rides of this nature will be produced um, as, a, as a direct result of, of people riding Piranha Matavia and just being as impressed with it uh, as we are. Uh, all right, so switching gears again, we, we're like back to North America. You could get whiplash looking at the way that we laid out this list, but it's actually more. I think it's more fun that way. We could have like organized things in a more predictable way, but then it, I don't think it would have been as fun. So now we're, we're from one from one extreme to the other. We are in Shakopee, Minnesota. We're at Valley Fair, and we're riding. Excalibur. Yes. So Excalibur, I'm going to put it this way quickly. I've always called it this. It's like an old arrow mine train meets a Intamin and Megalite, and they have a little baby in the middle of nowhere, and that's what this ride is. Yeah, I feel that. That was definitely the Megalite. This Excalibur walked so the Megalite could run. There was something funny going on with this ride. In 1989, I guess I always imagined, like, Cedar Fair wanting to build a new roller coaster for both of their parks, because at the time they just had the two. And they built Magnum, and I imagine, like, Excalibur just being, like, the free gift with purchase. Like, they they spent all this money and did everything on Magnum, and they're like, well, we'll give you, like, a little tiny baby one um, for your other, for your little tiny baby Cedar Point in Minnesota. And they got Excalibur, which is basically, essentially, an arrow mine train. It's technically classified as a, as a special systems ride, but... I would say that aesthetically, yeah, mechanically, it's is, fairly it's, indistinguishable from a mine train. Yeah, a mine train with the beefier wooden supports. So initially, the coaster, which starts off with a lift and a steep drop, had a little airtime hill before this nearly 
well, I wouldn't call it overbank, but it's highly banked elevated turn, which turned to another drop, quite significantly steep and crazy for an aero mine train, let's call it that. And then uh, uh, this crazy helix and another airtime hill, another helix, all of this really high speed elements that you wouldn't see until the Intamin generations later where, you know, we're using one giant lift hill and keeping everything low to the ground. But Excalibur was way ahead of its time and it did that already. They had to replace the little airtime hill at the bottom of the drop because that was just too much. Yeah, um, for those trains, was it was too much. much. You could do it now with more ergonomic trains, but with the mine train vehicles, it was Can't just even not, imagine how painful that could have yeah, been. Yeah, it, it would have been a But real. all things considered, it's a really smooth ride. It's kind of hidden in the way in the back of the park, so by the time you get there, it's like the last possible thing you can ride. It is not near the entrance, not convenient, not really marketed. I think there's kind plenty of, of people who there. don't know that it's even there. Precisely. And then you ride it, and you're like, what the actual hell? This may be the best ride in the whole park. Yeah. Feisty, smooth. Powerful, very unique, classic, yet surprisingly modern. Yeah. Absolutely adore that yeah. ride. That's by far my favorite ride at Valley Fair. And when you go to Valley Fair, you think, oh, it's going to be like Steel Venom. Or it's going to be... Wild Thing. Wild Thing. Or Renegade. You know, one of those big three. Girl, absolutely not. Excalibur stole the show. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Another scene Stealing stealer. <laughs> Stealing, um, yeah. Park of the Track Zone is Madrid. Okay. So this is another park where you go into this park thinking you know what your favorite ride is going to be. It's either going to be, like, their Intamin inverted coaster with three inversions that, like, gives amazing Batman the Ride meets Top Gun at California's Great America-esque vibes. Um, or it's going to be Abysmo, their Mauer um, Skyloop extended model with, like, two amazing overbank turns and an airtime hill. And then you leave the park and you're madly in, vo- in love with Tarantula. Yeah, and that's then it's, it's the spinning coaster. It's the Mauer spinning coaster that's, like, tall as shit for a ride of this style. It's deceivingly way bigger than I, yeah, than it's I thought. Yeah, it's, it's, I even looked at pictures of it, and I was like, okay, whatever. Then I saw it in person. I'm like, this ride is huge. It's, it's massive. It's in a totally different size class. From the other installations of this ride system. Or this the is the extreme spinner before the extreme spinner. It really is extreme. And funny story, like we ended up bringing our camera with us because we didn't want to leave it on the platform because there's no lockers or anything. And there's a lot of people entering and exiting the the ride at once. So we just asked if we could like keep the camera. So we ended up filming our ride experience just because I was like had the camera wrapped around my hand and was and was riding and as matter of factly, but and it was just the safest way to keep our stuff. So we ended up filming our ride experience, and you can hear it in the way that we are screaming very dramatically. <laughs> we were just totally caught off guard by this ride. Because first of all, it's a completely custom layout, really tall, individual vehicles, quite a lot of spinning couple of great drops but the biggest thing is it's really a terrain coaster yeah so there's moments where you think you're on the ground and boom yeah, the massive through drops, the ride and then you kind of swim just through the, dissolve. Ravine, the ride just d- disappears tunnels i mean you think you have like kind of ran out of gas or uh, are starting to and then boom there's a whole second part of the ride that is kind of on the back side of the hill just apeshit crazy <laughs> That's like must be my favorite non extreme spinner spinner like by far. It's <laughs> Your just, favorite non inverting spinner. Yeah, it's just so good. It's unbelievably good. I yeah. cannot wait to go back I, and I, ride I that. I wouldn't think that I, w- I didn't think I would find a Mauer spinner that I like better than Winja's, but I'd have to give it to Tarantula. Yeah, Tarantula is so good. Balls out, insane. Talk about balls out, insane. Okay, yeah, that's Next. a good. This is a good segue. Um, back to the states. This is a, another coaster that we just rode. Um, for the first time, that I was so... Not, I guess to say I was pleasantly surprised is an understatement. But Gale Force at Playland Castaway Cove, a one-of-a-kind in, uh, SNS LSM full-circuit shuttle coaster. Um, this thing is so aggressive. It's like Skyrush levels of insanity uh, with some inversions and some great launches. You go through the whole thing twice. Oh my god, I still remember my, my necklace, my chain got caught in my face. Because the amount of crazy air, and then crazy positives, and then crazy negatives again, and the amount of lateral twisting it does, while it's also providing airtime. I mean, it's a ride the size of a backyard that is a multi-launched, 
high speed inverted. I mean, it's even smaller than a skyrocket two. Like, yeah, it's, it's more insane. compact. Like, why are there not more? And I'm like out a there? little offended that the skyrocket two is so much more popular than this thing because this is the ride that should Insane be everywhere. Capacity. Because this ride is apps. I mean, I was, I was almost, I was like laughing at the the the, the bonkers ishness of this ride. It was just so. I mean, I, I I had high hopes. I hoped it was good. But it's just not one that I hear as much about as I feel like the ride warrants based on our experience. Cause it not just, at all. It was just marvelous. It was and this SNS ferocious. layout does quite a bit. First of all, you go through it twice, which is really refreshing. Um, yeah, the, going through it the second time was... It has several yeah. like peak elements, peak moments. I mean, it goes back and forth across the same little plot at least twice. And then you do that twice. So it's almost like going back and forth like four times. I can't believe times. there's not another one of these. It's incredible and it's so space efficient so smooth so comfortable i would like one at like every state i feel like this is another podcast episode prompt in the making roller coasters that should have already been cloned by now oh my god i'm gonna for some reason i'm gonna type it in after stuff because gale force is is going to be the one that inspired it this this ride is is built for speed built for multiple installations there's no business this ride being only installed once. Exactly. No business being only installed once. So, speaking of which, we're manifesting. There is a coaster that has been installed once, but it got an inverted clone, which is like next level. Cloning. Oh yeah, that is really funny. Um, Gold Rush at a Taxi Park Saharan is next on our list. Yes. Um, kind of set us up for failure because Gold Rush opened the same year that Hang Time was going to open, or the year before we wrote it. Infinity coasters. We wrote it the same year that. Um, Hangtown is going to open at Not North Prairie Farm. Farm. And so we're like, okay, great. We'll get a little little new, similar-sized Infinity Coaster ride in, and then Knott's is, hang time is going to be just as great. Well, set up for failure, because Hangtime is not nearly as bonkers as Gold Rush. Despite Gold Rush not doing as much, it's a, um, a shuttle full-circuit coaster, so it does use its launches to shuttle a little bit. It's feisty. you got mad airtime, snappy inversions, Really great pacing. It replaced a classic um, Schwarzkopf, looping star looping from Schwarzkopf yeah. that I adored as a kid because I was raised like, only a few minutes from this park. So going back and riding it, I was really excited, but I was not prepared for what world-class insanity Gold Rush really is. This thing, I mean, I love... So now that full-circuit shuttle coasters are becoming as popular as they are, this one stands out for me for a couple of reasons. First of all, it has a long train, a 20-passenger, four-cross train. And secondly, this one is, is actually very straightforward in the way that it's developed. It's actually like Gale Force. There's no track switching or anything. It's a, it's a one-train wonder. It's, it's, a, it's a straightforward, full-circuit launch shuttle with one train, like the standard Skyrocket 2s. So, like, it's, it's not particularly flashy or, or complicated. It's not like... Um, any of these these modern shuttle coasters, like it's or, or something like Dark Coaster, where like the track switches mid ride, that's becoming very very popular. Um, so this one, it's not you know it doesn't have the best capacity for a but a park like Slaharan, it's it's just perfect, um, and it just flies through that layout. I think the secret to a coaster really exceeding expectations and being so surprisingly good, a ride like this, a ride like Gale Force is. Um, just traveling through the layout at a clip. Yeah. Like, really barreling through it faster than it looks like it might. I have a hard time picking my favorite element on Gold Rush, but the very last element... The dive loop. ...is this me. dive loop, where you snappy. do this incredibly snappy little inversion into a half loop, and it's one of those moments where you think you've written all the inversions you can possibly write, and then somehow this felt so different and so snappy and so amazing... That it was just unexpected. It was so good. Mm-hmm. All right, so our last of the non roller coaster compliment of this tour of surprising rides is actually a ride that um, shouldn't come as a surprise for most Americans, but uh, we've learned from our friends uh, overseas that this was, I think, a big surprise for most people, really any person who goes to Knott's Berry Farm. Uh, but the Timber Mountain Log Ride. Which is absolutely legendary, and yet people come and they ride it kind of on a whim, and then they realize like what they've gotten themselves into. I'll say I was probably pretty surprised when I first rode it because 
Knott's Berry Farm really truly is kind of a regional park these days. Cedar Fair managed, lots of big roller coasters. You wouldn't is necessarily associated too much with theming if you were just like a coaster enthusiast. So when you go to the park, you do realize that, especially now with the added, the newer dark rides and the reimagined rapids ride, there's a lot of theming. But really, truly, in its history, prior to the log ride, there really was maybe one really well themed attraction. And so when you ride the log flume, it looks nicely dressed up, but you don't know what's all going on in that mountain. And there's so many scenes and so many animatronics, and the smells are honestly the one the thing smells. I remember the most. Um, it's just a really great rapids ride. I'm sorry, a really great log flume hidden in this mountain with so many show scenes and animatronics, and especially since the 2014 or 2013 relaunch with all the new animatronics, it's even better than before. And it's amazing. Like This ride opened in the 60s. This is one of the oldest remaining log flumes in the world, and it's also one of the best. And it's because the ride has such a cult following, an amazing legacy. I guess it kind of makes sense, because like, you go to Knott's Berry Farm, and like some of the major coasters will have... like. You know, a half hour wait, and the log flume will be like over an hour. Oh, for sure. That's that like line crazy always line. has the longest line, and people are crazy about that ride. It's well loved, and the park gets it. Like they always want that ride to perform to the best of its ability because they know the public will always respond to that ride and wait in the line for it because it is so amazing and it's so well kept too, mm-hmm. beautifully maintained. Yeah. All right. So now, okay. So now it's a double feature. This is a park that we love talking about, and this episode was a great excuse for us to talk about two of their rides. Um, and it's Movie Park Germany, and we are talking... Which one do you want to talk about first? Well, let's start with their newest roller coaster, which is the Movie Park Studio Tour. Yes. Unexpected in the way that um, I haven't seen theming for a roller coaster on this level at a regional park ever before. Yes, I'm going to come for Germany regional park. <laughs> it's um, a regional park despite itself. Despite its one's big dreams for it not to be just a regional park. But that's besides the point. So Move Park Studio Tour is highly themed. You got a pre-show, you have very cleverly designed thematic pieces that kind of tie all of the park together as like a big movie studio and then that's you know a big sound stage that a lot of that is filmed in. And there's just so much theming. Every part of the ride is heavily themed, despite it being a pretty fast, feisty family roller coaster. Yeah, I would say that it's there's definitely a lot of great examples of roller coasters that have dark ride elements or a dark ride scene. I mean, we even we even talked about like Flip von Novgorod, for example, that has a dark ride scene. Um, Fly is a good example of a ride that incorporates dark ride elements. But then this ride is it, to say that it's just a roller coaster with dark ride elements doesn't cover it because it has several dark ride sequences. There's like five different scenes that are, and some of the scenes are connected with roller coasters. This is this ride. I think will always be remembered as one that really helped muddy the waters even more between roller coasters and dark rides. Cause like it's obviously a roller coaster. There's no denying that, but I wouldn't say that it's all that it, is not a dark ride either because there's a lot of slow moving traveling through scenes effects. Uh, it, it's, it's not, not a dark ride. Yeah. And I'm just used to roller coasters that have like a thematic edge, still having a very large part of the ride where it's either in the dark or it's indoor, where there really isn't anything happening. That's thematic. It's just like a dark space. Like even the mummy roller coasters at the universal parks oh, yeah. use a basic light up mummy fixture here and there just to like act like there's something going on but then in Move Park Studios where they'll build a whole scene with a giant King Kong and projection map fireworks and you blow through that in a couple seconds they did so much work for moments that you don't even get to appreciate I think if you read it like we wrote like 10 times Mm -hmm. and every time you saw something new we're like oh my god this is something new and it references all these movies and famous parts of Hollywood history or stuff from the from movie park itself it's just a really clever ride that is, like Alex just said, it's practically a dark ride, but it's also a well-paced roller coaster, and I don't think we see it very often, but when we do see it, it's in the same park. Yeah. Like, <laughs> the Moon other park mastered it. Yeah, so this, not only does this park have a roller coaster that blurs the lines on dark rides and roller coasters even more than, like, any of the roller coasters at Universal or Disney the, even the ones that claim, like, a ride like Hagrid that claims to be, like, to be a story coaster. I think Movie Studio Tour 
takes it even a step further. Um, and then on a slightly different tangent, you have Van Helsing's Factory, also at Movie Park Germany, which um, is a roller coaster, a little bit more straightforward. It doesn't have scenes in the same way that Studio Tour has scenes. Um, but it is a roller coaster that is completely, like, completely engulfed in a thematic uh, atmosphere, environment. So while there aren't there aren't really scenes except for some of the the, the lift hills have, the have lift scenes. Scene, and then I would say that you have that factory scene, like the first drop, and then you have the black forest scene. Yeah, and then you have the lift hill where it has like the animatronics that come at you and the old Gremlins guy that's in the mm-hmm. in, the in the train. Yeah. yeah, that's pretty cool. So this ride is a is a little bit more. It's definitely more roller coaster than dark ride. Whereas I think Studio Tour is a perfect. 50-50 roller coaster dark ride experience, um, but no less worthy of praise. Um, if you go in the, to this ride expecting a wild mouse in a box, that is technically what this is, but those expectations will lead to mind-blowing reactions from the reality of this ride. But even then, say you go in thinking, okay, it's a Gershaw buff that coaster, it's getting mind train-esque, which is, like Alex said, not incorrect, it still does that so nicely because it's a pretty feisty roller coaster. And uh, spoiler alert for those that haven't ridden, but there there is a moment kind of in the middle of the ride where it is a wild mouse. The wild mouse turns. And if that isn't the wildest freaking wild mouse turns on earth, it it's will just, break your ribs. It's insane. I still remember the first time riding it. Oh my god! You were like, Shintisha, there's... my friend and I, we went there. <laughs> we were so excited. We're like, oh my god, new ride, horse, so scary, so cute. And we end up riding it, and we get to that wild mouse part. And I was speechless. I was like, what is this? There's like little drops between every hairpin turn, and the speed at which you go through those. Hairpin I remember turns, riding this natural roll a couple years after it opened, and thinking like, there's no way that they can willfully allow for the ride to travel <laughs> those flat hairpin curves at that speed. I mean, I was there with Ace. I thought they were fucking with us. And pitch black. Like, you cannot I, I, see I'm them. Riding, I was kind of like, like, like doing it. crap. Like, how can they? And so I thought, like, when I went back with you, I was like, oh, it's, they will have had to have slowed it down. No. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> that is... It's not a bug. It's a feature. Uh, <laughs> oh, and it's so good. And so it's funny because I will say, I think a lot of our listeners, even some of our friends are like, you guys just love Move Park too much. And I do have obviously a history with that being kind of like a theme park my family went to a lot when I was younger. But at the same time, every time I go back as an adult, I'm objectively like, bam, they hit that right on the nail. They did it so good. This is a perfect little example. And it's really unique. Movie Park's rides over the years and their infinite trying to get creative with IPs and getting creative with what they can do with a theme and a budget and what Parques Renidos will let them do. They've gotten some really creative, cool products like Fun Helsing Factory and Move Park Studio Tour mm-hmm. that definitely deserve a little bit of praise. I mean, we could have put Area 51 on this list too. Like, that's their Pirates of the Caribbean flume dark ride thing where you're in a volcano that's secretly an alien headquarter Thing. Now it's I just mean, a mountain. It used well, to yeah, it was a volcano. Yeah. Now it's a mountain. But like that ride is exceptional too, and totally unexpected. Basically, the movie park Germany's like the charm with movie park Germany is it's got some like Disney quality rides or Universal quality rides that you wouldn't expect because the park is you know just it's not necessarily on everyone's radar. It's a regional park. Yeah, and there's definitely rough edges at the park. Don't go in there thinking, yeah. wow, Universal. And it's not... But, yeah, you know, it does have some standout attractions that are definitely. unexpectedly incredible. Yeah. Unexpectedly it's the episode would... Incredible, with, yeah. <laughs> ...would suggest. Um, next up, uh, this is actually such a fun one to talk about because we uh, haven't yes. never talked about it on yeah. Coast to Kings Radio yet. Yeah. So, last November, we sailed the Caribbean Oceans... In search for this one roller coaster, which is really the reason we picked this You're itinerary. So dramatic. <laughs> it's true, though. We had the choices of many itineraries, and we chose this itinerary because we had to stop in Labadee at the Royal Caribbean's private island to go ride the Dragon's Tail. Yes. So in Labadee, Haiti, there is a private peninsula. I guess. Yeah, a peninsula with some islands, an archipelago of sorts um, that is owned by Royal Caribbean. And um, Sean's a travel agent. Book with Sean. Yes, Sean at MagicalMouseTravel.com. Send yeah. an email, will get you on your way to ride Dragon's Tail. Yes, anyway. so this was sort of a field research project for us. 
um, that was sponsored by Magical Mouse. We went on the Royal Caribbean cruise and like went to the Dutch Antilles and stuff. We had the perfect itinerary for us because we wanted to ride this roller coaster and go speak Dutch in the islands. And that's exactly what we did. And the roller coaster was sort of like, a, you know, we're going to do it whether it's good or not. We're doing it because we're doing it. Then we got there. We got to Labadee. Labadee is the most angelic Oh my god, Paradise. it was so great. I loved it. I have ever seen in my life. They I have, have these classic ruins. You can walk over like these really old ruins and all these like rocky beaches and then like really smooth beaches and uh like I, I was, I was to go back. completely unprepared for how idyllic and, and seemingly flawless this place was. Just an absolute treat to be there. And then the coaster, the mountain coaster I mean I would have we would have just been delighted even without the roller coaster, but the roller coaster it's a, vegan, a, a standard uh, vegan mountain coaster, um, standard in all ways, except that it has a fabulous layout and it's in paradise. What a, just a, a sublime roller coaster, just a marvelous ride. So there's this moment on the ride where it has like a double drop, which is surprisingly intense, especially for a mountain coaster. We've been on so many and I'm sure the listener has too. But that was one of those moments I was like, wow, this thing is feisty. Like it's going fast and we're dropping on these like on, on this rocky terrain. And the biggest standout for this coaster is it is hot out. It is humid. You are in the middle of the Caribbean. It is gorgeous. Palm trees swaying. The blue views. skies. The views. Like it's you're tall. on a mountain. It's a high roller coaster. On a tropical hill. And it's just like the setting is unlike anything in the world. Like you're just over the ocean. It's perfect weather. And it's just – it's so different from other mountain coasters where you're either like – Usually in a pretty mountains or hilly terrain, but it's either cold or snowy or grassy or, you know, some sort of tall trees. But no, you're on this rock wall in the Caribbean, living your best parts of the Caribbean life on this little roller coaster. And it was such a good mountain coaster to begin with, like ice closed, perfect weather conditions. Comparing it to others, you would be like, wow, it's just a good mountain coaster in general. And then you have that super unique setting on this peninsula and this bay. I mean, unexpectedly incredible. And we rode it several times. The staff were amazing. They were super oh, cool. They were so nice. Um, yeah, that was. Uh, I mean, I knew I would be excited to do it just because it's a roller coaster. It's in a funny place for a roller coaster to be in. But man, it ended up being seriously one of the highlights of our of our cruise. Feisty, feisty ride. So good. Um, so yeah, we're we're an hour in, but we are we have reached our final destination. This last roller coaster is one that I think the final sea battle definitely inspired this episode. But I think if we had to ask ourselves what roller coaster was truly the biggest surprise, um, it would have to be China Dinosaur Land's Dinosaur Mountain. So you go to China Dinosaur Land because you go there for Dinaconda, the big bad SNS 4D coaster that. Even Ishi and I get X2 wish they were as good. Yeah. And so you go there and that's your goal. That's your focus. That's the reason you're there. You fast track it over there and try to get on Dinaconda. And then you have the rest of the park to explore and you got a couple hours to kill. So you wander around and boom, there's this dinosaur mountain that you saw in RCDB once. You kind of forgot what even it was. You walk inside, queue is awful, smells like chicken feet. You're like, why are we waiting so long in this warm ass queue? And then everything is worth it because... There's this umbrella moto coaster that is actually a lift hill coaster with these giant spiraling helices and this great pacing, great drop, and this starry dome kind of show building with a giant skeleton of a dinosaur that you're going around. It's the best way that I can describe that. It's like where we have entered the inside of a giant fossil, like a like a fossilized cavern. And we're just exploring it on motorcycles, apparently. That are also dinosaurs. Um, so, I guess to say that this ride was amazing and a huge surprise was an understatement. We were so blown away that uh, instead of riding Dinaconda a third time, we wanted to get a second ride on this. And we waited like an hour and again for it. And we waited, and the line was excruciating, and it was still worth it. It's funny, because they do run two trains on it, um, and they have this, like... Ter- like the motorcycles are actually like pterodactyls of another That's a, yeah, they're they're like little yeah, dinosaurs that are folded in like, type things. Yeah. Um, and you're, mostly when you walk up to the station, it's just a million questions that are going through your head. Like, what is this? It's clearly a Zamperla. The theming is kind of cool, but you're just not sure what to expect. And then like you end, you know, you have the whole ride layout, which is really good and feisty and just great pacing, which. Usually the Samperla motor coasters are so small, but this was actually a pretty large, sprawling indoor layout, which was 
surprising to begin with. Um, very smooth. You would think, like, why are we in this writing position for this theme? And it somehow just worked. Yeah. And then you end with the weirdness like, of it. It's one of those things where, like, don't ask too many questions. Just enjoy it. Like, just enjoy it. <laughs> and then you end in this, the break one is in this cave with these, like, light up, light effects. It was just so strangely good that we did literally say bye to Dinocon and let us stand there. Yeah. Even though we wrote it only twice. Yeah. Just to ride Dinosaur Mountain. Yeah, we time. almost had to, we had to ride it again. I'm like, did that really happen? I was like, you know, if we only wrote this once, like, I might not be convinced that it happened. Like, or like, be very like, unable to recollect what, like, what, what happened? happened. This is really, it's the perfect ep- ride to represent this episode and a great final ride because I think something that a lot of these rides have in common, first of all, rides that we rode in China, which are harder to find information on, uh, especially some of the newer rides. This one, this ride it was, wasn't was brand new when yeah, we rode it. Yeah, it was in 2010, so um, it's been there for a minute. It had been there for a while, but like rides in China are harder to, I mean, we certainly didn't, we've never heard anybody's uh, experience on this ride before, because as far as I know, we haven't met anyone that's written this, or at least not. I think I know a couple many, of maybe a the handful. Park, but I'm sure like not Rob Alby has ridden it, like, but we've not. There is, this is not a roller coaster that we've heard anybody talk about that has ridden it, and also it's indoors, so this is not a ride that we can like pull up a POV for. There's a lot of indoor roller coasters and and dark rides and stuff on this list, um, like the movie park Germany coasters, for example. Um, so the fact that it's indoors, there's no way to videotape this ride. However, there is a clone of this ride. If you if you pull up this roller coaster or roller coaster database, I can't remember the name of it. There's a clone of this somewhere. exact same layout. So if you're curious about what we're talking about, we found out after the fact that there is a clone of this coaster that's outdoors. But the combination of this ride being enclosed and it being kind of obscure is what really contributed it to to it being such an exceptionally wonderful surprise because we could not have been more clueless about what we were getting ourselves into. All, I mean, I knew it was a moto coaster and then I had a lift hill. But that was it. Right. And uh, frankly, based on our experiences with those Zamperla motorcycle coasters, I was like, okay, whatever. Like, <laughs> sure, we're going to ride it and get the credit. You know, it's, we thought it was going to be like credit and forget it. And actually. Yeah, it wasn't the only motor bo- motor was, coaster that week. So we're yeah, like, whatever. It was not, but, yeah, it was so. That was a real, real treat. It's being so, so surprised by something, even despite all of the research and things that we could Would do. Would you say it was unexpectedly incredible? It was unexpectedly incredible. And with that, we're ending yet another episode of Coaster Kings Radio, Season 5. Every week we've got a new episode for you, so tune back in next week. We want to remind you to follow us on Threads, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and of course visit thecoastergames.com for news articles, opinion pieces, all of the above. And if you wouldn't mind, leave us a review here on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you're listening. It would help us out. And we will catch you on the next episode. Bye. Bye.